All right, David Carter. Miranda. Yeah, that's me. Richard Love. There has to be one missing. I don't think so. Brian and Jesse. Hey, we're we're all here. Six in a class, though. Um, the, you're the only five that I have on my roster, so. So if we drop, it's a really bad, well, if we drop, it's an early break hit vacation for you. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, how many of you have had me in a class before? All right. Online or in person? Both? Okay. All right, and, and yeah, you, I, I know, I've had you both. So I'm going to go over Angel. I assume you're all familiar with Angel. All right, um, so I'll go over how I use it and the stuff that's on it. Then we'll get into the specifics for this class. Um, let me bring up <laughs> Angel. We'll go from there. This is going to be a challenge for me because... challenge, but I got the dual monitor thing going here, because I plugged my laptop in, so I can bring it from one screen to another. I remember the first time I saw that, that flipped me out. It's like, no, you can't really do that. Someone drug over a window from one window to another. <laughs> uh, most of the action is on the content tab. You can use report to review your grades. I will suggest when you review your grades that you only look at the individual uh, assignment grades because the way that the averages are computed are sometimes a little unusual. All right. So therefore, I suggest that people only look at the um, individual assignments. And then you can average them out on your own. Um, communicate. One of the ways that you can communicate with me or other members of this class is via angel email, or you can email me through my regular campus email, mzellers at lorraineccc.edu. On the content tab, syllabus, we're going to come back and go over that in some detail. Copyright and fair use in education, that's less of an issue here, but I post this to all my classes. This relates to using things like images in your assignments that you get online. Um, as the fact that we're in an educational environment, we have more flexibility than you would out in the general public, you know, whether you're doing something commercially or even if you're doing something just for personal use, there's still copyright laws that concern that. It always cracks me up when I, I see a lot of people will post something on Tumblr and it will say something like, uh, something to the effect of, um, I'm not claiming ownership to this. I'm using it according to fair use and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, that's not the case. That's not true. Uh, but at any rate, um, you know, it's just a matter of whether they would want to pursue it or not, the copyright holder, or if they were even aware of it. But we try to respect copyright law in this class, or rather, we do respect copyright law in this class. So for some assignments, you may have an image. Probably not as prominent as in many of my other classes, but you might have an image or something, in which case, just put a footnote somewhere saying where you got it, just so that we make sure the copyright is respected. Lectures and examples, currently that folder is empty. I will put videos of the lecture. Um, we are recording the videos um, using a camera up there. It's not great quality recording, but at least if you were to miss a class, at least it's something. All right? At least it's better than nothing. The one thing I would urge you is I've heard a number of students say that reading the code it can be difficult in those examples, which, yeah, it is. But I, I also post the examples. If I go over a particular um, uh, problem, um, I will, in addition to posting the video, post the code. So that might help you you know, see what I was typing at the time. Assignments, there'll be roughly one assignment a week, and there's a drop box for it. The first assignment's pretty easy. We'll probably come back to that at the end. And then there's a discussion forum where you can post 
within reason, anything you like. All right. You can pose questions. Consider it the equivalent of like raising your hand in, in class and in asking a question, because then everyone gets a chance to see it, and everyone can participate in in answering it. You know, that way, if you know for whatever reason, you know, you see a question on the on the discussion forum before I get a chance to answer it. Hey, you can give the person a quicker answer. It always helps if you can explain something to someone else. All right. Let's look at the syllabus. read you every word on the syllabus. I'm sure that will disappoint you quite a bit. That, if anything, is one of my largest pet peeves. Like when I go to people's presentations and they read the PowerPoint slides. It's like I can relate to the animal that gets their foot caught in a trap and ends up gnawing off their leg to get out of there because I want to gnaw off my leg and get out of there when people do that. So I'll try not to do that. But I do want to point out some of the highlights and some of the most important parts. The top part, um, and again, there's some formatting issues with this, oh, with my email address, but I think you can follow what it's saying here. The top part details all the ways that you can get a hold of me, all right? Most of them. The phone is probably a less preferred option by me because I don't check my phone messages as often as I check my email. So email is probably the better way to go. And it really doesn't matter to me whether you send it via angel email or through my regular LC email account. Either way, I check roughly with the same frequency. So it doesn't really matter that much. Now, this class. We have a lab session immediately following the class. The, the class actually, and again, I, there might have been a mistake on the, um, what you call it, but the lecture should be from 5.15 to 6.30. And the lab should be from 6.30 to 7.20. All right? I don't, I'm not sure what it says. I thought I made the correction to it, but um, apparently it didn't. So the lab is a good opportunity for you to ask questions about stuff that you're having problems with. If you look around, you are 20% of the class, each individual. So if you have a question, that's a significant percentage of the class. That's 20%. And a, a, a great teacher proverb is that anytime one person has a question, there's a good chance a second person has it. So now we're up to 40% of the class. And then if you have one person that's kind of on the fence about the issue, we're heading towards a clear majority here. All right? So if you have a question, by all means, ask me. All right? The worst I will do, I promise, is tell you, let's talk about this individually after class. You know? That'll be the worst. If I think it's something that would be better addressed one-on-one. -on -one. That's the worst that I'll do, but it will never hurt to ask because it's a small class. Um, we may have uh, an occasion to have a sort of lecture lab intermingling where we don't come to the lecture room, but we go to the lab room if it's available, which it probably is, and we can work on stuff there. Who in this class has a laptop? Does everyone? My suggestion would be that you bring your laptop because there, there always is a little bit of an issue transferring stuff between computers and running different versions of the IDE and so on and so forth. So if at all possible, my suggestion would be to do that so that you can get around those sorts of issues. Then we could even have sort of lab sessions in here. We don't even need to be in the actual physical lab room to do that. So that's my, that's my suggestion. How many of you have had the Java class? All right, so th three and, and, and a sorta. Okay. Um, 
And that's fine. It's not a requirement. Uh, one of the reasons uh, I understand there's a problem with the textbook, purchasing a textbook. Is that correct? This one? Yeah. I mean, they have it. Does everyone have it? Or? I found a free version available on Safari. Okay, excellent. A uh, free version is available on Safari online. If you, if you need to know how to access that, you can access that from LC's library site. The only thing you need to do is have your library card number so you can log on. All right. Um, so that's fine, too. Um, my suggestion also would be to download the examples that are listed somewhere in the book. Somewhere in the beginning, they give a URL for the examples and to download those. All right. This course will introduce the development of software applications. Really? Software applications? I must have had a bad day when I wrote that, if I did write that. It's either me or Norad. Uh, for mobile Android devices, phone and tablets, I'm starting to read, so I'll stop at this point. <laughs> this section here is important. It should be more than just empty words. These are the words that we actually have to publish as our official course description. And you should read them because it does sort of help you. The reason I share them with you is it does sort of help you focus on what we're here for. All right? And we all have a good idea, but sometimes it's good to remind ourselves. So this is a good summary of that. Um, instructor approach, this is your class. I've already touched on that aspect of it, being a small class definitely has its advantages in a lot of respects. All right. One thing I did not mention, I sort of got, got off track, is other ways to get a hold of me if you have questions or problems. One thing I do is I allow any student in any of my classes to show up for any of my labs. So whether it be an online class or a campus-based class or whatever, I have labs, I have a, a, a day and evening class, Monday through Thursday. So this would be the Wednesday and Monday evening class. But Monday through Thursday, I have a day and evening class, and you're welcome to show up to any of those labs, and I will publish a schedule for that. Is this your only uh, Android course? This is my only Android course. I do have an advanced Android class that's running online. I just meant like if we missed the lecture, but we wanted to be for there for a live lecture. No, there's not another one. The, the best, video. yeah, the best, yeah, that would be the best option okay. to do. All right, but you could, for example, show up in the lab and, and ask what we went over or something like that. My second pet peeve, by the way, I'll tell you all these pet peeves. So, you know, is when students miss a class and ask if they've missed anything. That always amazes me because it's like, no, you didn't miss anything. We did not do literally anything the whole time. It's like, of course you missed something. The better question is, is what did I miss? How can I make it up? What should I do to get that material? In addition, I have office hours. And I'm not sure when my office hours are going to be. I know as evening students, um, it may be advantageous for me to have some evening office hours. So I'm going to mull that about in my head because I kind of have a weird schedule this term. Um, and I'll, I'll decide when the best time for me to have office hours would be. All right. But the office hours and a lab schedule I'll publish within the next several days, I would imagine. Please read through the late work policy and read between the lines a little bit too. All right. And I'll sort of give you my spin on it to sort of help you read between the lines. If I know a student is diligently working on their stuff, late assignments don't bother me. What bothers me is when students, and, and I get them in most, in many of my classes, every semester, a student will show up the first week or two of class, disappear for a while, then at week eight will start showing up again or whatever. Now, to be sure, maybe something happened in their personal life, all right? Just let me know. You don't have to go into details, just, you know, I'll be out for a week because of a personal situation. That's all you need to say. And I don't need to know the details of it or anything like that, but stay in communication. So if students are staying, if they're keeping that line of communication open with me, and they're letting me know if they're going to miss extended periods of time without any personal details, or if they're here and they're asking me questions, 
and they're showing up for lab or showing up for office hours or whatever, the late stuff, I won't say I don't care, but I really don't care that much, and I won't necessarily deduct at all in a situation like that. However, when it becomes um, very repetitive and habitual, where each assignment is becoming late, that that's a that that's a, a signal to you that you know we need to talk it out and figure out what what the issue is and help you get back on track. Maybe there's something you're just not understanding. Maybe you need to devote more time to the class. Any number of possibilities. Maybe I need to go over something again, something that I assumed you knew, you don't, whatever. Could be a lot of different reasons. So that's part, a big part of your responsibility in this class is bringing to uh, that attention. So just keep the lines of communication open with me. That's all I ask. If you can do that, I will be as reasonable as, dare I say, any professor here on campus. It always cracks me up. I'll have I'll say that an assignment is due, you know, the the 28th of January, and I'll have students ask me what time. It's like I don't know what time. The 28th, you know, sometime the 20. And I laugh, but I know there are some professors. You turn in it. Did it say it's due at 8:01? No, it said it's due at 8 o'clock. So it's late. So I'm not like that. All right. Chance I wouldn't even notice if you turned it in. If I did have a, a time deadline for that. Um, Again, different professors take different approaches, and I think that is a good thing. I mean, based on their personality and just to get students a way of, of seeing things different ways. I would rather you take the extra time and turn in something good than rush to turn something in. I'm, I'm confident everyone in this class can turn something in on the due date. But, <laughs> but I hope it's something that's good, something that works. All right? One thing that I do, and... I curse myself towards the end of the semester when the grades get backed up, but as I give students an opportunity to rework assignments. So, for example, well, no, not just you. Uh, you're not the only one. Uh, if, if there's something that you didn't quite get right, all right, maybe you missed a part. Maybe I asked you to do three things and you only did two of them. Maybe you just overlooked it or you weren't really sure how to proceed or something like that. Maybe you misunderstood my instructions. All right. I'd rather not have those debates like, well, you said to do this and I did it. Yeah, okay, well, whatever. Let's not have that dis discussion. Let's, let's just n talk about it, figure out what you need to do and, and, and rework it. All right. If you think about it on a job, ideally you'll do things perfectly the first time, but if you did make a mistake on your job, guess what? You're going to be the person who's going to clean up that mistake, right? So, therefore, this is a chance for you to do that, all right? So, I will give opportunities to rework assignments um, in this class. Don't take it personal, you know, take advantage of it. Because this is such a small class and because transferring applications from one machine to another can be problematic, I may grade your labs like right here uh, with you, if at all possible, if, if you're here. That way, again, I can watch, I can run it through an emulator uh, or, or uh, through an Android device and, uh, you know, I can give you immediate feedback. All right. That seems to work out good. You know with emails it can be difficult to, like, without writing a novel to explain exactly what I mean. And if it's not clear, you're liable to get the wrong impression. Whereas if I'm sitting there with you and I say, no, this should be over there, I can point on the screen or whatever, you know, and, and you can get a much clearer uh, picture of the show. All right. There'll be three quizzes. What blew your mind? Quizzes. I don't think I've been in a course with you yet. I, 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 I don't do that. The reason that I don't do that is I usually give tests or quizzes in classes where we don't have a project. You either get quizzes or projects. And this class, this is one of those classes that's kind of hard to have a project because until you get to a certain point, it's hard to do anything big. If, if you know what I mean. You know, in, in the HTML class, CISS 216, after the first couple weeks, 
if you're a clever person, you can start thinking of, well, gee, this is how I can make a project out of this, you know. Whereas the Android, you know, it's towards the end of the semester where you start to get dangerous with this, you know, where you start to get skilled with it. So rather than having like rushing and having a two-week final project, I thought it would be better to have quizzes. The quizzes generally are, well, as a dentist says, it's not going to hurt. The quizzes are generally very painless. They're, they're pretty easy. They're really, they're geared towards to make sure that you really kind of haven't dropped the ball uh, on this. Some, what I would consider fairly straightforward questions. The assignments are due the Wednesday, oh, I'm sorry, the Monday of the week. This first assignment we can extend a little bit because, again, we had Monday off. This is assuming a normal normal uh, week. Um, so you can turn it in Wednesday if you want. But it's assigned one week and it's due the next week. In other words, your first lab assignment isn't due this week. It would be due next week. All right, and you can turn it in Wednesday. Actually, for that matter, all of these you can, you can turn in Wednesday. We can just change it to that. And typically quizzes I, I give online to not take up class time. They're usually short enough where they're not that big of a deal. This sort of gives you an idea of the schedule. Are we covering the whole book? I do not believe so. No. I, I think we have shot for, in the past, we've shot for 13 chapters. I don't believe we even got through all 13 chapters in previous semesters. Yeah, but but we've we, we've gone over that. I may do things a little bit different. Again, the nice advantage, the nice advantage, a good advantage of, of being in a class small like this is I can experiment a little bit. I sort of had fun last term with this. You can ask the students in the class if they had fun as well, but I had fun. Well, we sort of deviated from my plan a little bit, and we wrote things like blackjack games, and we wrote things like if you've ever played the card game set. We did, we did uh, implemented uh, that. And it was a nice way to break it up because the, the examples in the Deedle book are good to a point, but some of them are kind of dry and we can have more fun maybe doing some other things. So we can still pick up the lessons from the Deedle applications, but we may apply them in a little bit different ways. All right, let me spend uh, a little bit of time talking about sort of the Android world, all right? In some respects, Android versus iOS mirrors the whole PC versus Mac thing, all right? The iOS environment is a much more controlled environment. That's one of the reasons that we have two Android classes and only one iOS class in our curriculum. Um, Android you can run on, you can develop rather, on any platform, all right? Whereas iOS you would need a Mac to de develop uh, um, that and, and run uh, Xcode. In addition, iOS runs on a handful of pieces of hardware, iPhones, iPads, different generations of them, but that's it, right? And Android runs on a, a myriad of hardware. You know, a lot of different hardware manufacturers make um, devices that run on Android. So you sort of have the same sort of situation as you have in the PC world. In one respect, a more controlled framework is easier because there's less things to worry about. But it comes at a cost. The cost being, you know, the expense of the hardware, the expense of a license to develop iPhone applications versus that. The ability to create an Android app um, that you can run on your own phone without going through the Google Play Store. You can do that without hacking your device. There's security settings that allow you to say, yes, I know 
I'm not going to, you know, go through the authorized uh, Google Play Store. Where, as to do that on an iOS system, you actually have to jailbreak it and have to essentially hack this, the, the, the device. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, the idea is, is that iOS, you know, gives you a, a packaged experience. And the hope is, is that by doing that, it can be a lot smoother. Whereas Android gives you options and a lot of stuff and options sometimes are good and sometimes are bad. Some people don't want options. Some people just want the one button that you click on and they don't have to worry about. Some people don't want to worry about the right and left mouse button, right? They just want the one button, all right? Again, I'm not here to argue one or the other, but just sort of paint the picture of Android versus um, iOS. The other issue to consider is native applications versus mobile enabled websites, all right? Typically an organization will do sort of all of the above, all right? In other words, they will develop an iPhone app, they will develop an Android app, and they'll mobile enable, or mo enable is the wrong word, um, mobile optimized maybe, I don't know what the right word would be, for their website, all right? The web is great, you know, it, uh, the, you, can, you can hook to any machine and you can browse it, but browsing, the experience of browsing is much different on a desktop machine than it would be on a handheld device, all right? So there's a lot of stuff that you can do to make it work better on a mobile device, all right? We're not going to talk about that in this class, all right? There is a class that does talk about those issues, uh, CISS 268, I think it is, mobile web development, where we talk about that. But just to sort of complete the whole picture, the Android, developing native Android apps, sort of the ecosystem in which it exists in is alongside of Apple's iOS and sort of parallel to mobile enhanced or enabled websites. Let's talk a little bit about a little bit more about the Android world specifically. The programming language used is Java. So that's the programming language to use. That is nice in one respect because if you become a good Android developer, you're learning and you're sharpening your Java skills. So, and Java skills are sort of a very high demand um, skill set. And Java is one of my preferred languages to work in too. So that's a good news thing on my book. Uh, Apple, on the other hand, uses uh, actually a couple languages, the main one being Objective-C, which is a different beast altogether. The development environment, or IDE, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment, you actually have a choice. And I really don't care what you use, other than to say the textbook uses Eclipse as the IDE, and I probably will use Eclipse. But I also run the other option, which is Android Studio. Android Studio is, is newer, yeah. I mean, within the past year, yeah. maybe even more recent than that. Like new, uh, you know, and, and Eclipse has been around for ages, but Eclipse isn't specifically an Android platform. Eclipse, you can develop desktop Java applications as well. Android Studio is specifically for Android, but it's a newer pro uh, product, and as a result, you have all the issues related to um, being a newer product. Yes? I think uh, Microsoft just re released a uh, SDK for Android as well, so I'm pretty sure you can do all that in uh, Studios too. Really? Yeah. I was not aware of that. Convert it? To the best of its ability. To Interesting. Uh, I'm always skeptical.
skeptical of those kinds of solutions, whereas you, you know, where you translate or emulate or it throws an extra layer in there that where something could go wrong, mm -hmm. but that might help people sort of transfer their skills from one to another, you know, from one platform more easily pick that up. Have you heard of it? Uh, it's called Xamarin, that company that has that IDE where you program Android and iOS using C Sharp. I have not heard of that one specifically. That's, they're getting bigger. They've been around for about two, three years. I have heard of PhoneGap, which yeah. is a way of developing applications using HTML. And you can write HTML5 code that goes and um, that you can go and create that. In the, in the mobile web class, we, um, we, uh, we take one of their HTML5 pages that, they, that they've optimized for mobile and actually create uh, a native Android, I think, Windows, Blackberry, and iPhone, except that if you don't have a key for, you know, if you don't have the credentials, you can't actually create the iPhone one, but it, it'll try to. I've Android Studio on my laptop. Okay. I've used it, and it's yeah, it's almost basically the same thing. Yeah, you it really get deep into it. it exactly for yeah, exactly for for an introductory level class. You know, there there's not a huge difference in reading back and forth. You know, um, you know, if you talk to two programmers about which is better, you'll probably get three different opinions. You know. Uh, so uh, again, you know, I'm a little more familiar with Eclipse because I've done the class since the start with Eclipse, but I've also used Android Studio. So that's your preference. Read it up, see what installs easier, uh, take a, a shot. There is also the Android, and again, you kind of get this, the um, ADT, which I can't remember, uh, Android Development Toolkit? I think, yeah, I kind of pulled that one out of the air, so to speak, um, that, that, that has things such as the emulator and so on. I've had really bad experiences trying to run the Android emulator, though. All right? It takes forever to do anything. So I would recommend, if you have an Android device, to test that way. And if you don't have an Android device, you can borrow one, like for the duration of the lab, or you can even take it home. Um, I have several of them. I'm not sure how many of them. I think you can get an Android device from the Family Dollar Store now for about ten bucks. You probably can, yeah. right? And, and it'd be good enough to test on and right. all that. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure. But, uh, but there is an emulator. But again, I kind of steer clear from it. And that's one thing I did forget. So I'm going to go in. And um, I don't know if I'll do that. Uh, I'll bring. I'll normally bring uh, a device to class. I'm not sure if we will or not for today's class. What I want to do is. Oh, I say it seems like I'm missing something, and I am. There's also a bunch of XML files that are associated with this. All right, XML. How many of you have had some experience with XML? All right. XML, yeah, it's a little shaky. Essentially, it's sort of a tag-based language. So it's not a programming language with like loops and assignment statements or any of statements. It's a way of representing certain data, which can be in a hierarchy. That is, there can be nesting. And again, if you know HTML, you pretty much know XML, all right? The difference being that XML allows people to develop formats for their own particular uses. So for example, the user interfaces in Android are typically built via XML files, all right? There are constants, string constants that you might have, like a message that appears on the screen or a label for a text box or something like that. Those are typically stored in an XML file. So you don't have to be an expert in XML and, and you'll, you'll understand it pretty quickly. All right, what I'd like to do now is bring up sort of the whole Hello World 
app. And I am going to go and grab an Android device real quick. I do have one. I'm going to... I need the cable, though. I'm going in and I'm importing and I'm going to import an Android application and I'm going to browse and find it. Is this is how you open up a pre-existing one? A pre-existing one, yeah. Okay. Uh, original. There we go. Their welcome app. All right. It did find, in fact, that there was an Android project in there. All right. So I'm going to go and click finish, and it's going to import it. Takes a minute. Here we go. A welcome application. 
you'll notice there's a whole bunch of folders here. All right. I'm going to click on the welcome and I'm going to right mouse or control click on it and I'm going to say run as Android application. this I, I probably do because I've used this in other classes This was actually his old laptop, and I've changed it. I've changed a lot of things, but still, we get the occasional thing that comes up as being Paul Norod's name on it. Yeah, it's not that big, big of a deal. And actually, it is launching the emulator. We'll let that chug in the background for a while because I'm having no luck with this. All right. While that is chugging, while it's thinking about it, let's look at what this app is comprised of. All right. Our work is going to occur... The Android jar is the Android framework, so we don't deal with that other than making sure that we have a proper version of Android installed and all that. The source is where our Java code lives. So we're definitely going to deal with that, all right, because that's where our Java code lives. Gen gets generated, so you don't really edit that. In fact, if you do edit it, it's going to regenerate it when you re rebuild it in going to get rid of your changes. Likewise, bin is the binaries, and that is the result of the compilation of it as well. I skipped one. Assets. We will put assets in the asset folder at some point. All right. The asset folder is where you could put things like audio files or um, other stuff, uh, additional sort of files that you're using in conjunction with the application. The last one that we're going to do is the resource folder. And we'll do a lot of stuff in the resource folder. Notice there's a bunch of directories here. And these directories um, contain the XML files that we use to describe certain parts of the app. So let's sort of rewind and review that. Source is your Java code. We're definitely going to deal with that. Assets, we might deal with later, but not right away. And the resource folders, we're definitely going to deal with. So for now, source and resources are the two places that we're going to devote most of our attention to. All right. What are in the resource files? Well... Resources, right. Notice, first of all, that some of these resources
some of these resources have the same, some of these resource directories have the same name or the same start of the name with a dash and then something following that. All right. We're not going to get it, we're, we'll kind of get into this now, but we're definitely going to come back to this throughout the term. The stuff after the dash is what's called a resource qualifier. All right. A resource qualifier tells the Android operating system, if certain conditions are met, use these files, otherwise use those files. And probably the best example for that, that I can pick, is the values folder. The values folder is where we put all our string constants. So we're not going to have any string constants in the code. We're going to have all our string constants in an XML file. What do you suppose the advantage of that is, putting all your string constants in an XML file? They're in known files. They're known files, so you only got to, remember, it almost always relates to maintainability, right? Yeah, exactly. So in other words, if I had a certain title that was used throughout the application, I put it in one place, if I change it there, it changes everywhere. I don't have to go and hunt it down in a hundred different places. If I just put a list of all my string constants in a file, then I can go and make the change once in that file and that change will be reflected everywhere. The other advantage with that is localizing the application. In other words, what if you want a version for French folks? All right. What if you want a Spanish version? What if you want a German version? And so on. All right? So you have a label called name in English. Uh, what is the word for name in another language? Nombre, I think, is number. Well, that's a good one. We'll use number instead right. then. Let's say we, let's, since we know this one, right. Or, or, yeah, we'll keep it real simple and say yes. Let's say we have a yes somewhere in our application. All right, a label that says yes. All right. We could then, if it's in an XML file, we can create a Spanish XML file where yes is C. And we could uh, create a French resource file where yes is we. Or we can create a German file where yes was ya. Yeah. I, I think that's but much yeah, but much louder. Right. Right. Um, that's what the resource qualifier is. In other words, you look, here's values. That is the default string files. This is the default file that contains all my string constants. This is the file we're going to use if the Android device has its language set to French. So we don't have to program that. All right? Android operating system will recognize that this device was set up for French. And it will, instead of pulling the labels from the default file, it will pull the labels from this file. Now, in this case, all I have is English and French. So in other words, Everyone would get English unless your phone was set to French, then you get French. But if your phone was set to German or, or Spanish or whatever, since there is no resource qualifier for those languages, it would be set, they would get the default. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, if I actually uh, set up a resource qualifier for something like, okay, values uh, dash M for English. Right. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think. I don't see why not. You might want to warn me before you do that, so. <laughs> yeah, so so I can read your assignments, but yeah, you should be able to. Yeah, there you go. Let's look at these string files, and we'll look at the two side by side. a couple different ways. This is sort of a semi-graphical way. I usually prefer to use this method. 
and I'm going to copy and paste this into text edit. So I can make the files bigger, so you can have a fighting chance of being able to read them. All right. So let's look at this. This is simply an XML header that says what version of XML we're using and all that. Every XML file has a root tag, sort of like your every web page has a root HTML tag. In this particular case, it is uh, the root tag is resources. This is a string resource. The name of the resource is hello, and in the English version, it says hello world, comma welcome. Underneath it, it says welcome, and then welcome to CISS 265. So there's three string values in here. We'll see how we're going to use those in a minute here. Let's open up the French file. This is assuming that my two years of high school French paid off. paid off, yeah. Same string variables, one called hello, one called app name, one called welcome, but between the start and end tag, the actual value of these tags is the French translation. Bonjour à tout le monde. I think that is hello to the whole world, which I don't know. Unless you speak French, you don't know otherwise. Right. <laughs> the next one I do know, bienvenue means welcome. All right, that one I'm pretty confident on. And then bienvenue, CISS 265. I assume Android is still Android in French, so I didn't translate that one. All right. Now. We'll see when we look at the UI in a minute here. When I want to make a label say something, I don't refer to this. I refer to this name. Because this name, the user doesn't see. This is just used internally. So it doesn't matter what language this one's in. The user never sees it. The user sees this value. All right? So let's look at the UI. The UI is in a file called main.xml. Now notice there's a layout and there's a layout dash large. All right. The la dash large would be for larger screens. So what does that mean? That means that you could make two different layouts all right, for a smaller phone versus a larger phone or a larger tablet. All right. So that's also a resource qualifier, all right? Language was one example of a resource qualifier where we can specify, hey, if it's French, use this file, otherwise use this file. The size of the screen is another example. If it's large, use this file, otherwise use this file. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of resource qualifiers. They're gonna, we're going to see a third one either today or Monday, and that is this, the, the screen density, the density of the pixels. That's what these are, HDPI, LDPI, M, MDPI, and XHDPI. All right, that relates to the screen density. So this is really a great aspect of the Android development platform is you don't have to worry about having some kind of custom code that looks to see what language the device is and do something different. You simply, or if it's a bigger screen, do something different or whatever. You simply create these resource folders with the resource qualifiers and Android 
picks the ones that are appropriate for the particular platform that you have. So I'll try to demonstrate next time. I'll figure out what's going wrong with this. But if I set one phone up to be French and one phone set up to be English, if I run the same app on both phones, I'll get a different, it'll look different because the one uses one, one uses the other. All right, here is the layout, the basic layout. And again, there's a graphical view that works like crap in Eclipse, all right? It works a little better in Android Studio. I typically just go to the source code, right? If you're looking at the code, you have complete control. So even if the graphical view worked, I would use... the code view. All right. So it's an XML file. We're not going to have time to go over this in its completion to, to completion. I want to point a few things out to this about this. Um, and then I want to um, take a brief look at the code. All right. So we sort of cover the whole picture, at least to some level. And then we'll come back and fill in the gaps later on. First thing you notice is the root node for this XML file is a relative layout. What does that mean? That means that you position things in relation to other things. In other words, you say, I want an image here, and I want this text below this other thing. There's relative layouts where you describe how things are in relation to each other. There's also linear layouts where you simply stack things either vertically or horizontally on your screen. Now, here's a text view. All right. Notice the value of the text. The value for the text is going to be, this will be the equivalent in, in ASP.NET of like a label, all right, a text view. Notice that the value of the text we set to is at string welcome. What do you suppose that corresponds to? That corresponds to that, those values in the XML file, so it's going to pull and it's going to make the value of that label the value of the string called welcome. So if we look here, it's looking for the value of the string that we named welcome. So, what's, what's the at string portion? The at string says that it is a string resource as opposed to some other resource. So it's a resource, it's not hard-coded. Right. That's sort of what the at sign means. The string means it's a string resource. All right, we'll see other kinds of resources later on. And then the, the slash name represents, or slash welcome represents that it has a name of welcome. Is that, that I'm assuming that is case sensitive, right? Yes. Okay. And again, in this way, we don't have to specify a different French and English layout. All right. Whichever language the device is set to, when it creates a screen, it will pull that value from the appropriate strings file. Let's see, by the way, if the emulator is still thinking about it. Amazing. Right now there's an Android and an Apple duking it out inside your computer to see who Yeah, right, right. Exactly. And if you notice, we have other things as well here. We have an image view. We'll leave that for now. Um, yeah. All right. I said we were going to look at the code, so let's look at the code. 
This code, since it's a Hello World app, let me see if it happens to be on this guy already. does not appear to be, unfortunately. Essentially all it is is the message with a couple of images. A, a little bug that's on the front page of the Deedle book and the little Android robot guy. All right. Our code, welcome.java. All right. All it effectively does, since this is just a Hello World app that pops open a window, is it says, set the content view for this activity. An activity is more or less one thing that you're going to present to the user for them to do something with, even if it's only to look at. All right. The content view for this activity is our layout main. In the resources, in the layout fo uh, folder, and it's called main.xml. So that's what ties this to, whoops, this. In the resources, in the layout folder, the main XML. So all that does is displays the splash screen. And that's all the application does. Now the one thing that I neglected to mention, there's another file that's important. Um, that we'll just look at for a minute and we'll, we'll spend more time looking at it later. That is the Android manifest file. It also is an XML file and it contains things such as what the icon for it is and what the name of the app is and what gets executed when this application starts and so on. Along with the minimum SDK version. This one is looking for 15. That might be why I didn't recognize this phone. I'm not sure. Let's lower it. You can you can specify a minimum. Okay. Yeah. And again, this gets this gets complicated, but yeah, you, you can specify that is it this version or higher. That's the I think that's one of the only downfalls of Android is that technology is rapidly growing. So it's really hard to make programs today that will work on a device from just as little as a year ago. Right. And there we go. It did this is running an earlier version, and now it recognizes that. See, if I'd have done what I was supposed to, look at the manifest, I would have figured this one out earlier. But now we go and run it, and sure enough, change the language to French, hoping that I know enough French to change it back. Right. I remember playing Japanese video games where it's like that. Like you got to go 
it, it, I picked the third option and then the fifth, you know, it's like you know, a pain. I think metal slug, the only way to get that is in Japanese. All right, language and keyboard. Select language. All this has is English and Spanish. Well, this will be a good test. So if I bring this up in Spanish, what should the label say? No, it doesn't say anything, because I didn't have a Spanish resource file. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it says just in English. How could I create a Spanish resource file? Well, yeah, or I can just pretend this is Spanish and rename this. Goes uh, off the letters after off the dash exactly. And those are preset, I'm assuming. So yes. So English is probably what E or English is default, obviously. Yeah, and it probably is E. Uh, that is a good question. Let me. <laughs> let me try. SP. I've heard it said that USB things only have two positions, and yet it always takes at least three tries to get it in. You'll be happy because they just actually announced like a week ago that they made a, any way it wants to USB. Yeah. So you can put it on an upside down or right side up. That will save me a half hour a day probably when that is, when that is a universal. So let's run it as an Android application. All right, I want to run it on that device. And it still says welcome, so let me try it to ES. Well, well why, why guess? Let's Google it. Android... Resource qualifier. Language values. That's probably why I use that. Let's just try ES. There we go comes up with the alternate text for there, all right? So, it should be, let me see if I have to reinstall it or if I can go and change it and it will change it back. So right now it's showing French, which it thinks is Spanish. Let me go and change the settings back to English.
anyone know what the word for settings would be in Spanish? Config settings? Should just be able to drag down the top bar. Okay. It is ajust. A J U S T E S. I think that is language. All right, got it back to English. Now when I open up the app again, it's back to English. All right. So that's a lot of power to be able to do that. It makes it solves that one big problem of how do you localize an application. And we'll use a similar technique to do things like how do you handle a phone like this that has a tiny screen versus a tablet that has a gigantic screen. Or even how do I handle a phone like this that might not have that great of pixel density versus one like my phone which has great density and great resolution. All right. So the resource qualifiers will let you do that. All right. That's enough for today. We're going to revisit these things as we continue with other projects. The next step will be for us to look at how I can write code to find things in the UI and do something with it, like do a calculation or, or whatever. All right. Your first assignment, if I'm not mistaken, is by and large just running one of these applications All right, and just giving me screen print showing me that you ran it. On, our, on your devices, um, and again, really this exercise is making sure you have an, a development environment where Eclipse or Android Studio is installed and you can run things. All right, so that's really um, the assignment for this week. Other questions? All right, excellent. That's it. Oh, yeah, no lab today, so. Well, is anyone staying for lab?